Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm indeed going to talk about it, the iterated random permutation problem, and this is joint work with uh, Yannick uh, And there will be a small application to uh, cascade encryption. So, well, the uh, general outline of the talk will be pretty much the same as the previous talk, so uh, it's a straightforward. Uh, it's basically, I'm going to say what the iterated problem is and then uh, basically solve it and there will be a main theorem and a matching attack. Uh, so let's start with a simple question. So assume that you are uh, slightly paranoid and you don't want to use a yes as is. So you would like to increase its security in perhaps the simplest way possible by uh, composing, it, composing it with itself with the same key. So we are assuming, assuming you don't want to actually use more entropy. So it's just a single key. And these are black box things, of course, so you don't need to worry about uh, changing key schedule and the effect that would have. And uh, a sim simple question I was mentioning is, uh, assuming AES is secure uh, by itself, is this actually secure? So you would expect that it is, but uh, can you prove it and have a, a bound on actually how se secure that would be? So um, first of all, I have to say what I mean by secure. So by security, we mean the standard definition of strong pseudo randomness. So you have a distinguisher that is trying to distinguish uh, your construction from a uh, random permutation. And this adversary is adaptive and uh, also two-sided. So adaptive means uh, every query he makes can depend on the output of previous queries. So the adaptive part is actually important because uh, if the adversary is not adaptive, this problem becomes trivial. It's not interesting. And uh, this problem is uh, naturally related to cascade encryption. So cascade encryption is the case where you would iterate a cipher, but you would actually use independent keys for each uh, cipher. Uh, in this case, there are, this is well studied, and it's uh, really interesting because actually in this case, you can amplify the security. This means that the security of the uh, whole construction would actually be better than a single block cipher. And this is a really, really interesting topic, and it, this has been proven actually in several settings. So not just uh, information theoretic, but also computational. But uh, what we are interested in here is the case where the key would be the same uh, every time. And in this case, uh, as far as I know, there is uh, basically nothing that is known. And um, well, you would expect quite naturally that in this setting, you, would, you can't hope that this is going to increase security, that there would be a security amplification because this would be a bit magical. And indeed, there is a Simple counterexample, if you take the function that you iterate the block cipher as being just even Mansour, so even Mansour, you've heard about it yesterday, is a, you, would, you take a random permutation and then you put, a, you XOR in a fixed key on each side. And if you do that, then the square, uh, of course, would have the middle part here cancel out. And so you end up with the same construction, except we have a squared permutation in the middle. And, um, Actually, the best attack against the event Monsoor construction doesn't really use the fact that it's a random permutation in the middle. You don't really need that. So if the random permutation is random and the best attack is generic, then the same attack would work here. And so uh, the, the advantage of the adversary would be the same in both cases. So in this case, there is no security amplification. So we can't hope to prove security amplification. But what we're going to show is much more modest. We're just going to show that uh, there is basically no loss. So there is a very little loss of security when you do this construction. So uh, heuristically, uh, you hope that it's going to counter a lot of attacks, etc. It's going to make a lot of attacks more difficult. But in the theoretical thinking, what you can show is that the security loss is very small. So in general here, um, we're going to think as R, the number of rounds as being constant. And uh, well, n is the message space and q is the number of queries. So you can see that basically the security loss is uh, proportional to the portion of the input space that you have, of the message space that you have queried. And um, well, the two terms here can be explained very naturally. Because uh, when you measure the advantage of the adversary here, uh, you are basically uh, measuring the distance, uh, statistical distance between the, your, your uh, block, well, block cipher, say, and a random permutation. Well, if you forget the time. 
component. And when this term is actually the distance between the rth power of your uh, block cipher and the random permutation. So it's this distance. And uh, since you know, well, this distance can be expressed very naturally in terms of this one. Since when you have access to uh, E, you have access as well to E to the R because you're adaptive. So of course, if you want to query E to the R, you would query E R time a longer chain, and that would give you the answer of E to the R. So uh, any uh, adversary who is trying to attack this can be lifted to an adversary who attacks this at the cost of multiplying the queries by R. So of course, this is bounded by uh, this advantage at the cost of multiplying the number of queries by R. And so if you want to bound this distance, then you have this term here, and then the other term would be the distance between a permutation and the rth power of a random permutation, which is the other term that you see here. And this is actually what we decided to call the iterated random permutation problem. So basically, how many queries do you need to distinguish a per random permutation from the rth power of a random permutation? So this is a very natural problem. It's perhaps surprising that it wasn't really uh, tackled as is before. And um, it does show up in several places. Actually, it was asked as an open problem uh, in uh, the even talk on even uh, Mansour by Chen, uh, Lee, Lamp, uh, Sorin, and Steinberger at Crypto here last year. And it it's, was also studied uh, previously in, uh, in, in a few other places. So for example, uh, this paper, they tried to lower bound it, so they did from the other side. Uh, they, they lower. They, present an attack that distinguishes uh, P from P to the R. And uh, now, uh, just to give you a little more idea about what this problem is like, uh, you have to think of it as a problem about the cycle structure of the permutation. Because actually, the, the name of the points don't matter. All that matters uh, when you try to increase P to P to the R are the lengths of the cycles. So uh, for instance, if uh, you're trying to compare P and P squared, uh, the effect that squaring P would have on the length of the cycles would be that an odd cycle remains odd, right? Because if you have an odd cycle and you're making jumps by two in that cycle, you still have a cycle of the same length. Whereas if the cycle is uh, even, has an even length, then it's going to be split into two smaller cycles of equal size. So this is what the effect of squaring has. And so the problem that we're really asking is, well, you have these two distributions of length cycles, basically, and uh, how many queries do you need to distinguish that? And uh, as uh, was already, uh, as you could already deduce from, in, from what I said before, uh, we show as our main results that the advantage here uh, can be bounded by a simple expression. And again, we consider R to be constant, basically. So this says that it's really hard to distinguish, as you would expect, a permutation, a R power of a random permutation from a random permutation. And actually, we also have a matching attack. So matching here is, again, for constant R. This is proportional to the proportion of the message space you have queried, and this as well. This term is negligible. So what we really show here is that uh, the advantage of the best adversary trying to distinguish P to, from P to the R is a theta of Q over N. And to make it a little bit more concrete, if you were interested in the case as, well, as in the simple question I asked at the beginning of P versus P squared, then you have a pretty tight, uh, you have uh, bounded this pretty tightly. Because you know the advantage of the best adversary is going to be somewhere between half of Q over N and five times Q over N. So it's, it's a pretty tight bound. Uh, so now I'm going to, so this is the core result, of course. I'm going to give you an idea about how we prove this, because actually the proof is nice. You don't need, a, it's like a, a tricky way of combining uh, elementary results. And it, it, well, I think it's really nice. So the idea, the general idea is that we're going, well, we have two games, right? We have the game where you have access to the permutation and the game where you have access to the rth power of the permutation. And now we are going to introduce two more games, uh, GC and GCR, where C, uh, I forgot to write it, but C is a, a permutation with a single cycle. 
So C is taken from the set of permutation with Siegel cycle, and C to the R is the rth power of that, right? So we introduced the two new games, and the idea is that we're going to reduce the question of measuring the distance between P and P to the R. We're going to reduce that to the question of measuring distance between C and C to the R. And the nice thing about that is that every uh, distance here can be bounded very simply. So this is uh, less than Q to the N, R Q to the N, and R Q to the N. And you can see from here that we get this term. So um, let's start with uh, the, the first term here. How do you get the distance from P to, from a random permutation to a permutation with a single cycle? So uh, to see this, uh, you have to look at the lazy sampling version uh, of, uh, of this game. So this means that, well, primitively, when you have access to a game that gives you uh, access to a permutation, the, what the oracle does would be a pick uniformly, randomly uh, permutation and then give you access to that. But instead of doing that, and equivalently, it can just uh, um, compute the answer to each query on the fly. So uh, this would mean that if you, this is the view of uh, the person who is calling the oracle, and the dots here are the, the points of the permutation, and assume you have made, say, three queries, which are represented here by the black arrows, and you're querying a new point. Then the oracle can compute the answer to that point on the fly simply by picking uniformly at random among the points here, except of course, the points that are already answered to uh, other queries. And uh, this, in the end, if the oracle does this, it gives you a uniformly random permutation. No, if you do the same thing with a single cycle, then it's actually exactly the same, except there is one unique extra point that is forbidden, which is the unique point that would create a cycle if, you, if it was the answer to that query. And now what you can see when you compare these two situations, is that the only difference is that there is one extra forbidden point, uh, which means basically that this point has only chance essentially one over n of being picked here. And so naturally here, the distance is less than q over n. And then, uh, okay, so we have the first term here. Let's look at this one. And this one can be deduced immediately from the previous one. Because it's the same trick we said before. You have access to e, then you have, that gives you access to e to the r by multiplying the queries by r. And this is exactly the same. We know the distance between p and c. So we know the distance between, well, we can bound the distance between c to the r and p to the r just by multiplying by r. And so we get this other term. And so now we are done with the reduction, right? We have reduced our problem from p to p to the r. Well, not really reduced because we just give upper bounds, but still. We've reduced this problem to a distinguishing c and c to the r. And now, um, First of all, uh, so C, let's recall, it's, it has a single cycle. So uh, suppose that N and R are co-prime, then, then C to the R also has a single cycle, okay? So under that hypothesis, actually, C to the R is the same thing as C, same distribution. And so actually, in that case, the advantage would be zero. And so we are, in that case, we're already done, right? We already have the bound. So in, in the more general case, um, C would have a single cycle. And then if we let D be the GCD of N and R, then C, C to the R would, be, would have D cycles, right? Because, uh, well, uh, it's very natural. And so we are trying to bound the distance between these two things. And, well, Ideally, we would want something that is close to that as a bound, so there are several ways to do, the, to do it, but if you do it right, you get that bound. And how do you do that? Well, let's take a single cycle. Then we're going to, to uh, pick D distinguished points that are at equal distance on that cycle. So these, uh, these red points here. And we're going to redirect these points to form D cycles like this. So when you see this, this is equal to this, right? And when you see this, this is the same thing as this. And what have we done? We just redirected D points. And since D is the uh, GCD of N and R, then of course we have that D is less than R. 
And so we, we get that this is uh, less than R Q over N. So there are a few things under the rug here, but really very little. So it, it's, a, it's a fairly natural proof. And of course, as a result of all that, we get what we wanted, which is that uh, the distance here is less than uh, 2 to the r plus 1 q over n. And so in the other direction, uh, we mentioned we have a matching attack. So like I said, this was um, considered already before in a prior article. And what they did is that they counted a number of fixed points, which is natural since uh, in P to the R, you will have more fixed points. For example, in P squared, uh, anything in, in P that was a fixed point is still a fixed point in P to the R, but also cycles of length two become fixed points in P squared. Okay, so you have more, strictly more fixed points uh, on average in P to the R. And so that's the most natural thing to do, but if you do that, you end up with a, a really not nice expression because it's uh, uh, the advantage of that distinguisher is uh, the nth term in some formal series. And so it's not convenient. So what we do instead is another distinguisher that is probably not better, but has a really nice expression. It's, it has a closed formula uh, as an expression. What we do is that we query uh, a longer cycle, uh, a longer chain. And if a cycle appears, then we guess that we were in P to the R. And if it does not, then we guess we were in P. So we do query. Q queries along a chain, and then we guess P to the R if there is a cycle and otherwise P. And the advantage of that distinguisher has, uh, is, has this form, and the constant here uh, is, uh, has a nice expression, and you can lower bound it by uh, one half. And so naturally, you get that this is uh, more than uh, Q to the over 2n. And uh, basically, that, uh, that concludes my talk. So wh what we have shown is that you have a really nice uh, bound on uh, the distance between P and P to the R, and, and coming from a main theorem and a matching attack. And there is a direct application to cascade and friction with the same key, where you can show that if you compose the same block cipher with the same key, then you actually lose very little security. And uh, of course, uh, we can think of this as uh, perhaps the relatively easy part of a really hard problem, which would be to, um, to show security amplification uh, for, uh, for uh, composing several block ciphers without increasing the entropy, so using only a single key and maybe some, some hypothesis on the block cipher or a key schedule. So, Proving that sort of thing would be a major break, breakthrough. Uh, you can't hope to prove that in the um, information theoretic model since you're not actually increasing the entropy, so you'd have to do that in the computational model. And, uh, and as far as I know, there is uh, nothing in, the, in that direction, so that's a really interesting question. So thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions.